Hi, welcome to episode nine of the Women's Power to Stop War webinar series Behind the Peace Conference of the Century. My name is Emma Bergeser. I'm the International Women's Power to Stop War Co Coordinator, and I am very happy to see you all here for this special, special webinar. Uh, it's special because it's the last one in our series, first of all. It's special because I'm hosting you from The Hague, where we are already here to prepare for the conference. And of course, it's special because of our speaker today, uh, Madeleine Rees, the Wolf Secretary General. So let me take you through some technical stuff, and then I will take you through some of the basics of the conference, and then I will hand you over to our speaker today. So with that said, technical issues. So you are all muted and we cannot see you. That is okay. That is the way the program works. As long as you can hear my voice and you can see my screen, then everything is working fine. Uh, at the end of the webinar, after Madeline's presentation, we will have uh, plenty of time for discussion and questions. And to do that, you can push your uh, raise your hand button then. If you have any questions, technical questions during the webinar, please type them into the questions on your GoToWebinar control panel or on the chat, and I will try to help you. If your program for some reason locks you out or you can't hear us anymore, you can try to force quit and then log in again using the same link that you use now to get in. And finally, we are recording this webinar like all of our others. So please keep that in mind if you choose to ask a question or participate that you will be recorded. All right. So WILF 2015 Conference, Women's Power to Stop War, Uniting a Global Movement. As I hope most of you that are here today know by now, from the 27th until the 29th of April, WILF is hosting a major international peace conference. And for those that don't know the, the basics, um, it all starts in 1915 when over 1,300 women came together in The Hague in protest of World War I. They realized the inextricable link between achieving women's human rights, which at the time was really focused on their voting rights, and international peace and security. And they realized that without, attack, without tackling the root causes of war, we would never get anywhere. And now, 100 years later, um, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, which they founded, um, is still embracing their approach very, very much. And that's really what the conference is about. So we're coming together and uh, bringing many, many women together to celebrate our 100th anniversary uh, and to strengthen the peace movement like never before. And that's really what the conference is about. Um, so before I hand you to Madeline, really briefly, I want to take you through some of what will be in store at the conference uh, in the programming. Uh, I promise I won't go into everything, uh, just a little overview, uh, starting with the plenaries, which I won't go into at all because Madeline will go into those. Um, but we have, for example, over 47 sessions that are uh, everything from workshops to games, panels, films, roundtables, discussions, more. And um, they are organized by a bunch of different groups inside WILF, just like our WILF Academic Network, which um, is usually the host of our, this webinar series. Um, as well as, for example, the Young Wealth Network uh, and over 40 partner organizations that we're very happy to be working alongside with. Um, the topics of all these sessions will are very broad, ranging from everything from how militarism affects the environment to sexual violence, the implementation of international instruments, the economics of war, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all the sessions are online now, and we encourage you to have a look and see which ones you think you would be most interested in to attend. Um, then for speakers, we have 150 speakers on the website now 
who will be speaking at all these sessions and at our plenaries. So I, I promise I won't go through all of them. Uh, just a few I can mention, for example, Radhika Kumaraswamy. She is the lead author of the 1325 Global Review. She will be paying very close attention to everything that is said on 1325 um, to include in her work. We have, of course, Leima Gbawi, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate for her work in Liberia. And well, speaking of Nobel laureates, we also have Jody Williams, Sheree Nabadi, Tabakol Carmen, and May Reed McGuire coming, as well as, you know, someone like Amy Goodman, who is a, an investigative journalist and reporter, now host of the Democracy Now! show, um, who's done amazing work in letting voices be heard who often get ignored in the mainstream media. So we're very happy to have all of those. And you can have a look at the list that's also now online from academics to students, grassroots activists, decision and policy makers. Um, we have a really good lineup for you. So, so I hope you, you go through it. Um, then we have some more creative things going on, like the marketplace, which is really a chance for you to get to know some organizations better, where they exhibit their work and, and have you do activities with them. Uh, the creative corners really fit into that, which is all about the experience of the conference participant, where it's about uh, maybe taking a second to relax, taking a second to do something fun. For example, we have yoga classes in the morning lined up for you, photo walls and, and a lot more games and things like that. So it's supposed to be a fun conference and a fun experience too for you. Um, the public manifestation is our chance to get loud on the issue of uh, global military expenditures versus social uh, spending. This, we will be outside and it's a great opportunity for the press to really make our message really visible. So I hope you all will join us in that to literally move the money. And yes, I am being intentionally vague because we're still keeping it a bit under wraps. But I hope you will all participate because we think it will be really good. Um, then exhibitions uh, are really about showing what 100 years of history looks like because we say it very often, you know, 100 years, 100 years, but what it actually looks like to see women from 1915, from 1932, from the 80s, you know, even 2000, see their photographs, see their work and see the results of what they've done, uh, I think has been quite an important part of this conference. So. Uh, they will be exhibited throughout the conference space. And then finally, before I hand the floor to Madeline, uh, the festival, because we need to create a little space for just to let go, to have fun and joy and celebrate um, 100 years of activism. So we have a lot lined up for you from poetry from Ghana and the U.S. to uh, monologues and dancing and singing and uh, to close the night I can announce here for the first time we have a fantastic band lined up called the Bouncing Bones it is an incredibly cool rock group and for the occasion they have changed their name to the Bouncing Doves and so they will help you rock through the night with us on the evening of the 28th so I'm very happy to share that with you here. And with that said, I'm going to hand you over to Madeline Reese. She is Will Secretary General, and she will explain to you why the time has come for women's power to stop war. So Madeline, with that, you are unmuted. Go ahead. I am. Hi, I um, don't think anybody can see me, but you have a nice flat picture of me behind, in front of a pile of books. Um, shall I do? Oh, here we are. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Can everyone see me? Emma, you'll have to be my. I think so, woman. yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> well, greetings, everybody, from South Africa, which is where I'm sitting at the moment. Um, I was thinking we were going to show you, and just in case you haven't seen it, on our website, you can actually have a look at this inspirational three minute clip of the history of how WILF was actually formed and then what we've done over the years. 
And it truly is inspirational because it shows that how over 100 years, literally thousands of women, and imagine that, thousands of women from all over the world of different faiths different, and none, of different political ideologies and none, have come together for one sole purpose, and that is to find ways of bringing peace and an end to conflict. Um, we at Wilf have obviously thought long and hard about the best way of doing that. It's one of those things that peace being a composite, a composite of a multipl multiplicity of different things. It's like we have to go and unturn every stone to try and find a part that's going to be relevant that we can bring into that, whether it be dealing with arms, whether it be dealing with food security, whether it be dealing with who gets the right to control resources, and on and on. I'll be elaborating a little on that a little bit later. One of the things we believe in very strongly, it's not about what you do so much, it's why you do it. And that's why I think this concept of having literally hundreds of thousands of people over this 100 years working on trying to identify root causes, working together, it is why they have done it. It's the why, not the what. And I think that's very, very important when you think of how our world is run now and often how many NGOs get caught in the trap of the what, not the why. And this is why in our build-up to, to the 100th, we have put an emphasis on trying to pull together those strands of the why. Um, what we've done is we have looked at, as always, root causes, analysis of conflict, participation in peace process, and transformative justice as being absolutely crucial to taking the process forward. Um, but to do that, is you've got to have a plan. And a plan without understanding why you're doing it, as I said before, will not work. Those of you who have seen that inspirational clip, um, there's a backstory to that as well, because Nina Hansen put that together for us. Um, and when she first did it, she did it with the theme tune to the Game of Thrones. Now, probably most of you cannot have not heard about the Game of Thrones, um, not least because it's now hitting the screens again with great fury. Um, I didn't know about Game of Thrones, but the music is very moving and a little bit militaristic, and so Nina couldn't believe that I had not seen this and told me I should take a look. I duly did. Um, and you know what? I got completely hooked. But the reason why I got hooked is because it's this medieval fantasy, which is incredibly violent. It has in it executions, it has torture, it has deaths, it has all sorts of violence. It is a scene of constant war, and it's based on power. Power driven by economic realities, there's even an iron bank, and the ability to then use that economic resource in order to gain more power through the use of extreme violence. No human rights, no rule of law, no Margaret Wallstrom for feminist foreign policy, although those who watch it, we could have perhaps a talk about Khaleesi later on and see whether she's actually complying. But effectively, you have what we have. And I was really taken by something that was published in the Huffington Post just the other day. And Emma, if you could actually put up one of the slides. Right? What, it, what this person did was she juxtaposed what the, the main factors or the main component parts of Game of Thrones are, and she looked at what we have. And look at it. It is absolutely an indictment of our so-called civilization. We still have 2,466 legal killings, and if you add what goes on in conflict which are not legal killings, then you have tens of thousands. You still have torture in 141 countries, including rape, and that's new. That's new. It was not as bad as that before 2003, and the United States took the gloves off in relation to upholding international law, and everybody very happily fell, fell into line. Early marriage, 700 million girls alive today were married before they were legally adult. Big thing in Game of Thrones, marrying off part of your, your gang to another gang. Surveillance, badly spelt. That whole issue now of how free we are to actually go about our own business without being watched by our governments. Right now, it's, I mean, I think the United Kingdom is the most surveyed country in the world, pretty much. On war crimes, violations of the laws of war have been documented in 18 conflicts and chemical weapons, as we know, have been used in Gaza by the, and in Iraq by the US and chemical weapons in Syria. And what has happened in terms of accountability for any of that? Not at all. And so we've got, in fact, 
is a Game of Thrones, which has all of the things in it, but ostensibly in a medieval setting. We have it now, and we have it worse and in larger quantities, and how many of us are actually paying attention? And that is what is scary. We are in serious problems. We do have a descent into what they call in the Game of Thrones as winter. Winter is coming. And I think we have now got to fundamentally regroup, re-strategize, and organize ourselves as to how we're going to deal with this. And that was why I think we have changed perhaps the way in which we were organizing for the conference in The Hague. If you asked me three years ago what we would be focusing on, I don't think we would have done it in the same way. There would have been the same elements, for sure. But things have actually descended to the extent that we do now have to include more and different ways of working and thinking and analyze from a slightly different perspective. Um, what we've done when we started was we tried to base our work uh, on analysis as to the issues needed to prevent into this total chaos which is now arising. And if you think of it, this escalation has really happened over the last six months. From We started with Syria, but yes, we know there has been a complete deterioration, no peace process, nothing. We then had Ukraine breaking out into more full-on conflict than it had been previously, and now we have Yemen, Libya, all blowing with you know, military interventions being the norm. So we didn't have that to the same extent three years ago. What we asked was for Cynthia Coburn to use her genius to put together uh, the beginnings of a framework that would help to guide us. And what she did was she put together the manifesto, which has been drafted predominantly by her, but with input from um, a group of people who were very close to the issues, but then sent out for consultation with members of world, with the sections, with the XCOM, with the IB. And not, not everyone agrees with everything that's within the manifesto, but the actual content of it, the principles of it, are shared by all of us. And you can see on the screen there now um, what it is we've got. It's a reaffirmation in the manifesto of why we do what we do. Um, it starts with the prognosis about militarism, that we have to stop it as a way of thought. The militarization of societies, and I've got to say here, and I, I said this in New York at the uh, CSW, I think it was the year before last, um, anyone worried about the sorts of cartoons and the television programs that are being made for small children? And most of you who know me know that I have a little eight-year-old daughter who is light of my life. Um, and she loves to watch these programs about fairies. She still does. But not regular fairies, you know, hanging out with butterflies and smelling flowers and doing little bits of magic and all that sort of thing. These are kick-ass fairies who take on the bad boys. They're militarized fairies. And although she doesn't know the difference between that and the ones that I thought I was watching when I was little, there is a difference. And I think this is a way in which societies and cultures are making violence a normality from a very, very early age. And it's terrifying. And even last night, I was just watching an American program on animals in Africa. And it was all about the violence of one type of species against another as if it was pre-planned, pre-thought. And nothing like the David Attenborough shows you'd see about animals actually working together and living in harmony and all the rest of it. It was actually a militarized version of what happens in the African bush. So we start with militarism and how we actually have to address it as a way of thought and how that impacts on our societies. Next one, Emma, please. I should just say, um, Addy, when I talk about militarism, we've got to the stage now under international relations, and none of you would miss the fact that using military force is in fact the default position now. Um, and there, that has come as a direct result of the way in which we have been educating our societies and our cultures to believe that security comes through the use of military might. That's a militarization process which has gone to extremists. Capitalism. It sounds very old-fashioned to keep on talking about capitalism. Um, you know, I feel like an aging Marxist sometimes when I rage against capital. Um, but we need to, even more so than before. Not least because there doesn't appear to be an ideology which is offering an alternative. Um, what we have still is the exploitation of labor. We have conglomerates, conglomerates with, with global reach. 
um, none of them accountable to nation states. Uh, there is a pretense at regulation, but we know that it doesn't actually work in as it should. Um, there are ways and means in which we can try to make this accountable, and I think that's a discussion that will most definitely be had at the conference. Um, but in the meantime, you can see it as being the one of the biggest influences, one of the biggest drivers of militarization and of the sort of conflicts that we are now experiencing. And that's before we even go into the harm which is done to the environment as a result of that unaccountable power. Um, there will be much discussion, much discussion of the powers of the multinational corporations and the, you know, the, the issues relating to food security, et cetera, et cetera, and there needs to be. Um, one thing that has come out in an article by Naomi Klein fairly recently is that you know, we've got two years. We have two years to try to reduce global warming so that it does not reach above 2%. If it does, there will be a catastrophic consequence, and those consequences will inevitably not be dealt with with brotherly or sisterly love, but with conflict, more conflict, which will do more harm to the environment, and off we will go again, a downward spiral. Next one, please. Okay, nation state. This was the third strand that uh, Cynthia has in the, in the manifesto. Um, it looks at the, the way in which our, our frameworks have actually facilitated the rise and the dominance of particular states within our, multinational, our, multi, our multilateral system. And we know who they are. We know who they are, that we know how they manipulate power, how they manipulate the system, and how they continue with the imperialist projects of, of old. Um, interstate rivalry, occupation, contested borders, and the failure of democracy, political repression, intolerance of diversity, anybody for Game of Thrones, this is exactly what happens when you do not have international human rights law and respect for processes of accountability and democracy in <clears throat> uh, working. Next slide. You can't get to any sort of democracy unless you have social structures which actually facilitate real democracy, and that means looking and addressing at some of the ways in which social structures have, in, have created a framework, a context, in which militarism can take place. These social structures in our manifesto, we say, are, are dominated by the masculine. It's, it's, and I'm in South Africa, and I have to say there is still this very strong idea of racist supremacy, cultural dominance, and of course now we have, there's always been a, an issue of religious hierarchy, but now we have the rise of Islamophobia and other phobias, which are actually othering and creating greater difficulties in bringing different religions together. Um, we could talk a lot about how that has been manipulated, how that is used, and indeed how it's come about. But this is nothing new. This is merely putting a different label on what is always a process in creating appositional forces. It happens to be, in our particular context, more on basis of religion at the moment than it has been in a very long time. Go to the next slide. Then the one we all love to hate most, patriarchy. And I think this is something which is really going to, we need to really understand and describe patriarchy because so far too long, we have seen it as just being about male domination of women. Of course it is that, but it is more nuanced than that. And what we need to be able to understand, that it is about a dominant power structure, which is as useful in manipulating male gender as it is for manipulating the female one. It's very clearly about how power works, and how there is a need to create a masculine identity which is predisposed to use violence and a female identity which will actually support that. That's a very simple analysis, but when you think of it, how many people juxtapose their ability to influence power on the basis of their gender? Nearly all of us do. And then you have to have the intersection of the other forms of discrimination, such as racial origin, ethnicity, whether you're from indigenous communities, whether you have access to economic or social rights, and on and on. So you will have a situation where, and this is a real example from um, Ukraine, where you actually have a woman 
who was in the midst of, in the, the current government, and she spoke very openly at the uh, CSW about sending her son off to the front for six months, even though he was not medically fit to serve, but she thought it was a good idea that he would. Now, he was fulfilling that obviously gendered role. She was fulfilling her obviously gendered role. He clearly would not have been that happy with going to the front with a medical condition which should have taken him out. But the system, the system actually kicked in to make that the way it should work. She was being the compliant gender. She was actually help doing her part in actually fulfilling patriarchal needs to actually work on military solutions because that is the preferred methodology when dealing with conflicts. It does on the whole mean the subordination of, men, of women by men, yes. You've only got to look at the statistics as to how the world works in real life, where we are, and those of you who were at the CSW would have been totally disheartened by the fact that we were all excluded from the real power that was sitting over the road in the United Nations. We were actually divided and put into clusters of like-minded in groups of no more than 50 or 100 most of the time, not being able to work together, not being able to use the, the influence that we could have, because the identity of the entire institution, the way in which the systems work, is highly patriarchal. And we can talk afterwards a lot, I hope, about issues of how we work with the United Nations to try and get rid of that culture of hegemonic masculinities, which undermines our ability to change that power. It's no good being sent palliatives of you know, Security Council resolutions, go work on that girls and keep out of our way for a while. And we all know how that is now being utilized to try and say, let's have gender equality, which means basically including women into the military project. And that is not what we had in mind when 1325 was pushed for by work. Um, next slide, please. In the last part, or in part of the, the manifesto, uh, we set out what it is that's needed. And this may, again, sound like our rant against capitalism. This may sound like an old cliche, but we are not going to have peace unless we can have total and universal disarmament. We're not going to have it within the next five years, 10 years, 50 years, but we have to think of it as being possible or we're never going to get there. Um, if there were total and universal disarmament, we will not have to celebrate our 200th anniversary and I really hope that we don't. Um, what else is needed? Clearly a new economic order, referring back to what we were, our rant against capitalism. Um, we do have to have that. We can, the, the way in which the world is working right now is not sustainable. It is driving peoples apart. It is ensuring that the economic power lies in the hands of the very, very few. What is it now? It's going to be 20% own, own more than 80% of the world's wealth at the moment. And what are they doing with it? You can't even think of how they can actually, of how we can hold them accountable for the sorts of human rights protections and everything else we need. The legal frameworks have not kept up with that sort of phenomenon. So we need that to happen. We actually have to address and create a new economic order. To do that, we need this reformed multilateral system. Uh, United Nations, as most of you know, is in fact the biggest peace organization in the, wor in the world, although you would be hard pushed to notice it right now. And one of the things we know about that is that there is this huge problem with the Security Council and one playing, off, <laughs> one playing its uh, political demands off against the other. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but it seems very strange that you have a nice little dance going on between the United States and Russia as to who will block what resolution at the same time, at a different time. So Russia's doing the right thing on Yemen at the moment, and America is blocking. America is doing the right thing on Ukraine, and Russia blocked. And so it goes on. So instead of being able to fulfill what the Charter of the United Nations actually said, we don't. We end up with this tweak of those dominant nations mentioned before, who can then actually exert undue influence in terms of their own political and economic agendas, fulfilling the requirements of those who fund them, in order to continue to block any peaceful resolutions. And this goes again to the, the last one of what we say is needed, and that is the ending of male supremacy and a radical change in the way we live gender. Brilliant article in um, one of the local newspapers here by the communications person from Songking for Gender Justice, who will also be at the, the Hague. 
it was a person who's never identified as male or female, never. And so doesn't really see themselves as fitting into either binary. But is obviously a human being with all rights and everything else, and is now trying to assert, as we all should be, the right to that gender and that gender diversity. And until we understand that and still keep living this binary existence, we're never really going to move away from that binary. We have at the moment a policy in the United Nations of calling for gender equality. I think we need to have a serious debate about what that means because it sounds very much to me as if what we're talking about is no more, no less than comparing like with like. So women with men, let's have allow let men support women to have their share of what was termed the poison pie. There will be no change. We could be, as I mentioned before, they want us to be equal in terms of our abilities to be in the armed forces. So we could have women in the military, women as pilots, and I'm quite sure we do extraordinarily well. Um, been shown to do it extraordinarily well. But nothing changes if we do that. Nothing changes if we bring women in to be the captains of industry without a change of the structures in which those take place. So, vitally important that we end this. We change the way we think and live about gender. Um, all of the above are mutually reinforcing. And this is the thing that Wilf has been a, a examining and working on for the last, well, since 2011, 2010, 2011. And that is, we need to have an integrated approach to making all these different things work. Um, they're mutually reinforces, uh, sorry, they're mutually reinforcing. You can't do one without the other. Doing one on its own, it will wither and die. It needs the lifeblood, the support of the other elements to actually make it so that it is viable. Um, where are we going? Yeah. How do we get from manifesto to the conference? I don't know, there is the quantum leap. Um, as I said, it's been very much a work in progress and driven by so many different people that we can't possibly name them all, but also driven a lot by circumstances. Um, as I said, we want this conference to be as relevant to the moment and as catalytic in the moment that it can be. And for that, we have consulted widely and amongst those people who are perhaps the most cru crucial to talk with. Um, we have sections in 35 countries, so we have women living in, in all sorts of different regimes, in all sorts of different stases of conflict or non-conflict or post-conflict or nearly conflict or let's hope we don't have a conflict sort of place. Um, and that means we have a diversity of voices. We took our, our frames of reference from the work which is done by the programs of wealth, well, that's the Reaching Critical Will, they, they do everything military and anti-nuclear, and we rely on them totally to provide us with up-to-date information of where the military industrial complex is going in the world. And sadly, we know that today the United Kingdom has been very happily saying that there's no problem with having um, killer robots because They'll be much better at identifying whether or not killing women and children, um, what the emotion, so to de being objective about whether or not women and children will be killed because there'll be no emotionalism involved. I am reassured. So we have problems still. Um, we have still enormous problems. And this is one of the issues that will come out very much in our conferences is the use of um, technologies to ever create more dangerous and difficult to control armaments. Um, we have our Peace Women program, which does everything on women, peace and security, engages with Security Council, with our sections, and can tell us whether or not that the programs that are being actually implemented by states, oh, sorry, are being agreed to by states, are in fact being implemented. We have the Human Rights program, which works in Geneva to make sure that we have information going into the human rights mechanisms from the treaty bodies, through the special procedures, through the Human Rights Council, to the, um, the different universal periodic reviews which come up on the, the various countries, well, all countries, um, to make sure that what we've got is through Reaching Critical Will, Peace Women, Human Rights Program, we have the ability to work with and influence the multilateral system. And I say influence, I'm not so naive to think that just by being there and doing the advocacy and putting a huge amount of energy into trying to get language into resolutions, that is the panacea. No, it's not. But by being there and doing that, we are constantly reminding 
those who represent the, the nation states in the multilateral system of what their obligations are and what law says that they must be doing. And we are constantly reminding them and bringing to them the voices of those who are living under the sorts of regimes that they need to be dealing with. So grass, women come from grassroots into those fora to tell the truth. And this does make a difference. As part of that, we have our crisis response, which sort of works across and with all of these programs, so as to ensure that we are getting those voices into the system. And for that, we've been working very much in relation to Ukraine, to Syria, to Iraq, to Libya. In fact, there's so many crises, it's difficult to keep up at the moment. Um, with partners, we have worked very much with the Nobel Women Initiative, who have been hugely supportive. And as you heard from Emma, they will be there um, speaking and working with us um, on uh, on the uh, at the conference. Um, next slide, please. Um, but we have partners in other countries as well. And so when you look where we have been working over the last three years and more, we have got information from DRC, Nigeria, Cameroon, Syria, Iraq, Libya, Yemen, Bosnia and Herzegovina, an old conflict that will not go away, Ukraine, we have Palestine, I didn't put that on the list, but of course they're there, as well as many others. And this is, the, I think, the huge strength that we have in that the information that we are putting before that multilateral system really is descriptive of and analytical of the real life situations and what we are able to do by analyzing through the prism of human rights, of obligations of Security Council, of the state of militarization and arms trade in relation to those, those countries makes a big difference in showing how the system works to mitigate our abilities to deliver peace. It also shows how and where and how much it is needed to work at grassroots level to create the capacities for women particularly to participate in processes which could lead to peace. And we're showing very much in our conference that um, unless you have women at the peace processes, they don't work. There is no such thing as sustainable peace without the full participation of women. So we took a lot of the information from these countries in our sections and then others. Next slide, please, Emma. No point in us thinking that we know it all and we can translate what is happening at grassroots level into a system unless we have the thinking. And for me, it's always been hugely, hugely important that um, we dip into, I mean, me personally, but also Wilf as an organization dips into our academic network and to other scholars to actually find what the current thinking is, what the analysis is, how we can use it and how that can better inform our approaches to our work on peace. So we've partnered with the Women's Academic Network, that part of Wolf. Um, we have a very good partner in the Graduate Institute in Geneva, and I say that uh, because there have been two schools that we've been working with there. But in particular, we now work with um, Tanya Paffenholz, who will also be at the Institute, who has done all research on all peace process over the last four years, and can pr prove empirically what we need to do in order to ensure that what's happening at grassroots level, particularly from a gender perspective, can get into peace processes and then hopefully move towards a transformative process. Um, the things we have been most engaged in have been clearly political economy, looking very much at the work of Jackie True, um, Jackie Nairturk, others who have been looking at how that works from a gender perspective, because that is root cause. It is about looking at even things like education are part of a political economy analysis. And so when, you know, we, when we're looking at root causes, we have to look at political economy. We have to look at who has power, in what context, and how that works. We have to look at sexual violence and armed conflict to see what the patterns are, how that works. We've been working very closely on, on Iraq and uh, Syria to see if there are ways in which we can actually address or help them to work on identifying patterns of particular violences and how we can actually assist in um, working towards better uh, services and solutions. Um, clearly, gender and the way in which the world, uh, world order works is, is very much an academic pursuit, but a very practical one, which is why I'm so happy that Cynthia, uh, Cynthia Coburn was the one who 
undertook to write the manifesto for us, and that we have the likes of, of Cynthia Enlow coming to the conference, who can make gender analysis seem like eating a piece of bread. And she makes it so simple, so obvious, and so easy that I think there would be no excuse for anyone saying, well, your gender is all about women after this conference. Um, we have to look at peace building, we have to look at international law, we consult widely with international lawyers of the ilk of Christine Chinkin, Patty Sellers, et al, in order to make sure, uh, Louise Almatsu on, on international humanitarian law, to make sure that what we're doing is actually legally erudite and correct. We bring all that into our thinking on how to structure the conference. Next slide, please, Anna. So, moving on to the the, plena, the, the actual conference itself. Um, I've got to say that when Emma did her opening, I was actually quite excited because there she is already in the Hague, so it's already happening. Um, and I hope that people are now beginning to get really excited about it. I'm both excited and terrified. Um, we have a grand opening, which obviously is the French version because it has an E on the end. Um, at that, we have, um, what we'll be doing is be introducing the conference. So we'll be setting the scene for the conference. I'll be speaking and I'll be saying something, which I don't know yet, but I'm sure it'll be something um, that will welcome you and bring you into the conference. Um, we have Lema making the keynote speech, um, and that will, I'm sure, get us all fired up. The passion for change and the passion for peace, the why, back to the why we do it. How do we go from 1915 to 2015? Uh, we're still carrying the why, but also finding the what. Next slide. Then we go into the first plenary. Um, now this is this is the this is when I was talking all the way through uh, previously about how we have tried to structure based on what we've seen from the ground, what we know from uh, academic and analysis. We need to look at grassroots. We need to look at um, causes, root causes, and so we thought that the best way of doing this was to actually look at the political economy in the first plenary. I should say that what we, st what we did was we, we had this idea of the plenary as being like the backbone, if you like, the backbone of the way in which we wanted to cut the, the, uh, the conference to move forward. They're the backbone. Bone. All the breakout sessions then provide the flesh because in those there will be time for greater discussions on all the issues that are coming out through the plenaries. So when we do the first plenary, which is on you know, how gendered power uh, is a root cause. Um, we need to look at um, the political economy, and we will have Jackie True coming to speak to that. Um, we will identify that as part of root causes. We'll look at the political economy, the masculinities and gender-based violence. We need to look at justice, and then we move into the power politics and peacemaking. Um, it's an amazing panel. We have tremendous speakers on that panel, and what we're hoping is that will frame the beginnings of our understanding of where the next phase of conflict comes about. This is how it all starts. In plenary one, we identify how it starts. Then some of the implications, but then into the next plenary, which is, Emma, can you give the next one? Power, war, and arms. Um, and this is really the, the reaching critical will element of what, is, of what we do. So the why is to prevent the war. But what we do is we analyze, we look at, and we attack. Don't want to say the word attack, that's very military. We address militarization and the arms trade in the context of 2015. It's no good as looking backwards as to what has happened. Our founding mothers very cogently warned against the privatization of the armaments industry because they said it would be a Pandora's box. And they were right, because the minute you let the economics of capitalism run and control the reduction of arms, then you will always inevitably have more and more arms produced. Um, that Pandora's box was open, as we know. So now we have to look at in the context of 2015, who's selling, who's doing what, what are the consequences, how does militarization feed into us, allowing this to continue to happen? Why is it that we have this idea that if we have more guns, we are safer? And there's one country in particular that has a particular way of looking at that and addressing that. And we actually do have to look at how societies accept militarized uh, security as being the norm. Um, so that's part of that. 
But what we also need to address is the new technologies. I mentioned already the concept of killer robots and how the United Kingdom, the United States is leading the charge on this, but the United Kingdom, you know, obviously trotting along quite happily behind, and how dangerous and destructive these will be, and trust them in any case. And of course, the answer to that is no. So we'll investigate how all that works together. And then next one. What are we going to do about it? And this is the big one. It's the the why, the what. How do we move from grassroots into making grassroots activism to making these fundamental changes? Um, how to reform the system? How to address the environmental destruction? And what we want to do in this one is we want to actually bring women from grassroots organisations who have experienced the conflict in Syria, the conflict uh, in um, Yemen. We want to bring those who have worked on peace processes from Northern Ireland, for example. We want to bring activists who have played a role in making peace and what has happened in making that really work. What is it that you can do, how to organize? So within this one, what we hope we will be able to do is to show that the system is not actually working for us, but that we can if intelligently organizing, but through intelligently organizing, try to bring it back and what it is we need to do to make that system work. So we have enormous experience in the, uh, amongst those speakers who can actually guide us through that. Um, and that, again, will be complemented by the other, the group, the breakout groups at discussions, which will then feed into this, this last one. Um, last slide. I think it's the last one. Is there one more? Yes. No. Because I haven't finished yet before we get to the questions. Uh, in the end, what we want to have happen is not for us to come up with what most conferences come up with, which is just essentially a list of demands of governments, our governments, and a list of demands for the United Nations, because we know they're not going to pay attention to that. We make those demands all the time. We point out in our blogs, in our articles, where the system's going wrong, and not very much is changing. If we want democracy to work, we've got to actually look to ourselves to make that democracy work. You know, we need now, we know that the United Kingdom is opposing the, uh, the banning of kill robots. Let's get active. There's an election coming up. Get out there and make that part of the election campaign. Let's demand that they do not support increasing militarization. Same with, same with, with Trident. Get out there. Make it work. That's what democracy is supposed to be about. Do not fall for the othering that forces us into a situation of claiming security. No. We need to be the ones who will make that change. So what we need to be doing is all of us, every individual and every organization, I believe there's over 60 NGOs participating, yes, Emma? Um, we need to then say what we're going to do and how we're going to work together. Because the why we have, we know why we are doing this, and we know what we want. We just have to move from the why to the actual achievement. And if we actually do make these pledges, as to exactly what steps we are going to take, we put them together, we don't do what NGOs so often do, and this is why it's a social movement, not an NGO. We're not there to compete, to write matching project documents, to steal ideas, to take somebody else's money. No, that is something which is part of the problem, not part of the solution. We want a real social movement and we want all of us to be able to work together to make these fundamental changes. And not only will we do that, but we will dovetail that into the next big meeting that we will all have. And it's not just about meetings, of course, but in 2016, there will be another big meeting organized by AWID. It's the AWID, um, I think it's every four years they do their, their meetings. They, at that point, we can then have a look at what progress we're making in working together to address the problems that we have identified in our conference. And then from there, we could even think of demanding, and there's the demand, that the United Nations use its convening power to give and host another world conference, not the fifth world conference. Beijing we have. Beijing we want to protect. Beijing is a good platform for action. We don't want to open it as they do every time there is a review and try and pick off the things that governments don't like because they think it allows women too much freedom. No, we don't want to go through that anymore. We want a new one. We want a new one which is fit for purpose where we can actually 
regroup, re-strategize, and really make a fundamental difference. It starts on the 27th of April, and it will go on. And I have great faith in the abilities of all of those who come to The Hague to really make this something of a galvanizing moment to ourselves, to our systems, and in fact, to the multilateral system, to actually do what we're demanding they do. And that's use women's power to stop war. OK, now you can turn me off, and I'll take questions. All right. Thank you very much, Madeline, for that um, fantastic and very insightful talk. Just to, on the question you asked me, actually, we have 80 registered NGOs right now attending. So a little more. <laughs> so now we are at the discussion, question, and comment section of this webinar, um, giving you the opportunity to raise your concerns and ask questions. Uh, so if you have a question, uh, just click on your little hand icon on your control panel. If you're uncomfortable uh, saying your question out loud, you can also type it in and I'll read it out for you. So let's see, we have a few questions already. Um, Julie Kabukanie, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name. Uh, you are unmuted. Go ahead. Julie, are you with us? Ah, she has typed in her question because I think she has some um, microphone difficulties. So Julie asks, what is the percentage of male political leaders who support demilitarization? Uh, Madeline, I think that's an interesting question for you to take while we collect more questions. That is a great question, Julie. Do you know the simple answer? I don't think any of them do. I really don't. I mean, I haven't come across a cha single male champion of ending militarism because it, it's caught up with that whole gender identity issue. And I hope maybe somebody on the call on the, the webinar can actually does know the facts on this. But um, just thinking now about how the attacks on Hillary Clinton already starting is will she have the backbone to be the commander in chief and that was always the thing women will never have the um, the strength if you like to to push the button to actually launch a nuclear war to launch any war and that was always the big thing in the states about preventing women voting um, we're not allowed to make those decisions because we're too girly and that's highly gendered and that the opposite of that is that men in positions of power have to show that they are as virile and as competitive as Mr. Putin, for example, um, which is why you do get the, this refusal to vote against conflict. So even though there's one, like I said, Miliband, he did vote against using, um, uh, sending troops into Syria, using armed force against Syria, but it was on a very different perspective. So sadly, I can't think of anybody highly gendered, highly gendered in relation to conflict. All right, then we have Shelly Hanna has a question for us. Um, Before, and I'm sorry, I haven't got them in front of me, but they're very good questions. So maybe if you could uh, either get your microphone to work or type them in. Yeah, so Shelly, you're unmuted now from our side, but it, it shows that you have your own microphone muted. If you can unmute your own microphone or type in your question. There you go, try. Great, thank you, and uh, and thanks to all of you for uh, the um, inspiration and creativity and uh, and passion and commitment that has gone into you know not just this conference but uh, all that I know that you do in your lives. So thank you for that. Um, my questions um, come from I'm just gonna uh, read over. I, I sent some questions in a couple days ago, but it didn't sound like you have them. Um, I am wondering, I guess uh, ultimately. Um, my bottom line question is, what are we really hoping for and wishing for here? And I'm going to add a little bit of background to that. Um, as I hear you speak, Madeline, um, I'm, I'm kind of reminded a little bit of Einstein's words, you know, that we can't solve our problems with the same kind of thinking that we used when we created them. And um, I so appreciate the brilliance and the um, uh, analytical thinking of people um, like yourself and others who are picking apart, you know, just what goes into what we have now today. Um, but my creative brain also um, 
uh, feels like there's that's one arm of the conversation and the other arm is okay we know what we don't want are we clear about what we do want um, and and bringing in the uh, you know uh, what I'm learning in my own work about the tools of creation which are to invoke imagination and desire and expectation um, that we're not just resisting what's going on but we're in fact in an act uh, process of creation and I'm wondering um, is there any of that um, being planned for this and and I'm, I'm wondering too just in terms of of stepping outside of this paradigm like is there any um, uh, space for uh, a, a spiritual context or um, conscious evolution context um, that kind of stuff so yeah I'll le leave it to you just to kind of address that whole field of questions I guess no, I think you're absolutely right, and that's I think one of the things that's in our manifesto is that you know we have to imagine peace. We have to be able to imagine peace, um, and that's not just about the sorts of things I've been talking about. You know, being able to show what's needed to have a picture of peace. I mean, those things we know they're they're out there. We just haven't been very good at pulling them all together. But I think you're right. I mean, I personally do think you're right that there is none of this can happen unless there is. A different approach. It's sort of we're, we're all looking at everything from the perspective of our our own observation, um, and we're looking at it. Most of us are looking at it in a very let's say flat, pragmatic. What we see in front of us, what we are brought up to understand. I don't think we have a spiritual dimension. I think there is a need for us, not necessarily as a group, to do that. But this idea of imagining. The possibilities of a non-violent world, imagining that there can be peace. If we don't do that, then I don't think we're going to be able to do it because it's not going to be there in front of us, so we don't know what it is we're walking towards. So I think that that's a discussion that really is needed. Um, how or if that will happen in the context of our conference, I don't know. Um, there's going to be an awful lot of pragmatists there, but I think there's going to be an awful lot of people there who do have that uh, that desire to find a different way of approaching the problems. So, you know, if you're, are you coming, then if you come, then start one. We'll, we'll know who's going to be on the right lines by those who go to the yoga in the morning. <laughs> so, the next question is from Margaret Turner, who typed it in. Her question is, thank you for an inspiring and informative presentation. Uh, Madeline mentioned the effect of media on children. Will this have any place in our future agenda? Um, just, uh, I'll let Madeline answer that question, but uh, what I can tell you during the conference, there will be a huge session in the biggest room in the entire building in the in the theater room between Amy Goodman and Dr. Sabina Schiffer exactly on the manipulation of mass media and the effect that has on all of us including children so so that will definitely be a part of the conference but Madeline yeah no I think that that's a huge issue in fact I was just reading a very interesting article by John Pilger um, about I was, so I was trying to I was going to write this I'm writing this piece for Open Democracy about um, our conference, and there's a whole um, I wanted to, I was trying to think how did they get information from the front in 1914 back to the domicile population so how did all the willful women really know the extent of the slaughter and everything else um, didn't get very far but because I got distracted and I got distracted by reading this thing by John Pilger showing that there was an, obviously no brain. <laughs> There had been huge manipulation. There had been an absolute prevention of the real truth about what's happening to the men at the front getting back to the domicile population. Um, and that, in fact, his point was that the same had been true when he'd been reporting from Vietnam, and the same was true in Iraq when that, that famous falling of the statue of Saddam Hussein happened. There were very few people there. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of journalists, there were a few Iraqis around, but most of what was happening in Baghdad at that, that time was ongoing street fighting between Americans and ordinary Baghdad uh, Syria, uh, citizens. And you know, those, the, there was a choice as to what could be reported, and that was not reported. And his point, and I think it's a very true one, is how much of what we're hearing of what is going on is dispassionate, objective truth, and how much of it is there to increase our fear of Islam, to increase the legitimacy 
of the arms trade for our own security. So that we need more weapons in order to defend ourselves. We need to have the next range of missiles. We need to make sure that we have Trident renewed if you're British and on and on. So that they've actually managed to do the 1984 trick of cheating us as to what the real truth is and how much objective, objective news reporting is there when those journalists who are the bravest and go into the most dangerous of places are often censored and cannot get the material published. So I think there's a, there's a huge issue about freedom of the press and how to do it, but it's also about education. It's also about you know, how we educate, how we develop our curricula. And I would love to go, sometimes I think I'd love to go back to being a teacher because there's nothing more exciting than working with children in relation to how they can grow and what they anticipate. And the beautiful thing is that they all start off so just adorable and then it all goes badly wrong and sadly it's the structures of power and the sociological constructions which then force them into their gender roles and then we're off as we know but we were exploring that at the conference. I don't know whether that answers your question but I think that those are a very well taken points. It's education and it is how we portray what is happening in the world that is, is so important to, to actually understand. All right, then we have two questions that I, I think I can also answer a little bit. Um, first from Shelly Hanna, how many people are expected to attend the conference? So right now we're looking at uh, between 1,000 and 1,300 people uh, coming to the conference. So that's the same number that was there in 1915. So that, I think that's a, a nice way of bringing back our, our past. And then a question from Rebecca, who was a former intern at WILF. Um, she writes, Dear Madeline, Emma, thank you so much for the enlightening talk. I would like to know how can participants prepare best for the conference? What do they need to bring or, or know in order to make the most out of the conference and the agenda in it? Um, for my perspective, I would recommend reading the program for sure online first so that the first day you know which sessions you want to go to um, and you don't have to do that work when you arrive. Uh, the daily program, all the sessions, all the speakers are online now, uh, so that should really help you. And I would really recommend to get more of a perspective on what Madeline has been talking about today to read the draft manifesto, which is online. So those would be my two top recommendations on how to prepare, but Madeline? I just want to jump in on the, on the numbers coming as well, because when you think of it, 1,300 women came in the middle of a war when they didn't have internet, they didn't have airlines, they didn't have the ability to use social media, and somehow they managed to get in touch with each other, and get on boats, get on trains, get on whatever else was moving and get to the Hague, which is an incredible achievement. So I want to see more than 1,300 <laughs> there, because there should be, because we can do it now, and there's EasyJet. And so, you know, essentially, I know that this will be, there will be virtually far, far more than 1,300 people there. But there's nothing like being together, and this is something that goes back to this question of the World Conference. A lot of young feminists are really keen to have another World Conference, and quite rightly, um, because there's that power of convening women together who are like-minded and want the same thing is so important. And you can watch it on TV, you can get the feedback afterwards, but it's not the same as being there. And going back to what Shelley, I'm sure, would endorse this, you've got to feel that energy in order to be able to use it for transformative change. And I think if you're not coming, rethink that decision. If you know others who are not coming and you can persuade them to come, bring them too, because what we want more than anything else is people who, who know this why, who know that they want the change, and to actually come with us physically, emotionally, and with huge energy to make those changes that we need. So that's the rallying call. Um, and Rebecca, hi, what a difficult question because there's so much. You know, you could do a whole master's thesis on all the elements that we're trying to bring into this conference. Um, and that's why I think Emma's answer is very good in as much as if you get an overview, but you know what you're interested in most. So then focus in on those or do the other thing, the things you may already have expertise in go and listen to the ones that you haven't got expertise in so that you can understand that bit of the jigsaw puzzle. Um, but it's certainly we're going to have a lot of stuff online which is going to be useful. If you read over, um, I think that the, the Open Democracy 5050, they have done a series of Wilf 
uh, articles building up to the 100, which gives you everything from history to political economy to what's the foreign, a feminist foreign policy look like, the recent issue on Yemen, then I'll do the closing one soon. Um, that will give you an idea of the various elements, I think, that are, are going into this conference. Yeah, if I could, I just thought while you were talking, Madeline, some other things that might be useful for people who want to prepare. Um, so this is the ninth episode of the Women's Power to Stop War webinar series. We've done eight before, hosted by our academics in the network, uh, on a vast range of topics from um, a general introduction to the women, peace and security agenda to uh, the links between arms trade and food security to how to uh, implement international treaties at the local level and, and a bunch of others. They're all available on our website to listen to and on YouTube to, to see. So we definitely would recommend that. Um, and also uh, on the, the numbers coming question, we can also now add that we will be live streaming for all of those that are, cannot come. We will be live streaming and recording all the sessions, uh, all the 40 something sessions, uh, including the plenaries so that you can follow them live and even participate by sending us questions with the right hashtags and they might be included in the discussion then. So we really uh, encourage you to participate in that way if you can't be with us in The Hague. Um, then we have, uh, so Rebecca says, thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. So let's see any other questions or concerns would now would be the time to either raise your hand or type them in. I don't see any. My goodness, all of that and no one's got any questions. <laughs> Shelley says, thank you very much for pulling this seminar together. You're welcome. I was very, very glad that we were able to do it with everything that was going on. <laughs> uh, no, I think that's it. So... On that, can I just jump in and say thank you all very much for, for coming to the, the webinar. Um, I hope it has been useful. I hope it will encourage those of you who want to participate in something which I think is going to be really inspirational. If you just think of the people we've got coming, then there's no way you're not going to be moved to, to do more than you're doing even now. Um, and I want to say thanks to Emma. for uh, Without Emma, we probably wouldn't be having the sort of conference that we're having. So great thanks to her, but also for organizing these webinars. And um, hope all nine of them will be of use to you. And I hope to see you all in the Hague. All right. Thank you. So then I get to thank you, Madeline, for uh, speaking uh, today and sharing your thoughts with us. And then I will let uh, Barbara Chojanowska finish this webinar. Barbara is the wonderful uh, coordinator of the academic network and usually uh, speaks more about the, the network in these sessions. But today we're going to let her uh, do the closing and talk about the sessions that the academic network are hosting at the conference. So with that, um, Barbara, you are unmuted. Go ahead. Yes, so I would also like to thank you all for participating in this webinar and uh, for all your questions. I think they were like really good questions. And thank you, Madeleine and Emma, uh, for the preview of, of the conference. It makes me really excited. And to close, I would just like to very quickly invite you for two special sessions that the Wolf Academic Network will host in The Hague. And the first one is Academia and Grassroots Activism. And among the speakers, we are going to have one of the most, if not the most famous feminist researcher, Cynthia Law. And we are going to discuss the disconnection between academia, policymaking, and peace activism, and what we all can do uh, about this disconnection to really be more effective as feminist peacemakers. And the second session is student generating peace activism. It will be a very interactive and a very inclu inclusive workshop and will take a completely different perspective and actually give the voice 
to a cohort of students from around the world and they will teach us about the opportunities they see and also the, the challenges they face to become engaged as peace activists. So I hope you will be able to join us for these two sessions and so many, so many other sessions. And thank you for today and see you in the hug.